Hi, everyone. I'm Melody Hobson. I'm chairman of the board of After School Matters, an enthusiastic chairman of the board. So excited to be here today <laughs> and to be in discussion with one of my pals who is just a superstar in every way, <laughs> Carrie Washington. I want to welcome everyone who's who's tuning in. We have thousands of teens who are in our programs, and hopefully you're with us. And then there's so there are so many people who are a part of the After School Matters family, and of course our instructors. So we're just so grateful to have all of you with us and to learn from and to experience someone that I have so much respect and admiration for. Now I'll introduce her in a minute. This program will go for about an hour with Carrie and me in discussion for a bit. Then we will actually move to having our teen moderators, Carvel and Bryn uh, participate as well. Carvel is on the After School Matters Leadership Council. Yes, giving us the high sign there. And Bryn participates in After School Matters, the After School Matter, Matters Musical Theater Experience. So we're very, very excited to have them when they will come in and be able to ask questions of Carrie and hopefully get great advice and advice that um, will help them as they pursue all of their dreams, which we hope to be fulfilled. So I want to start by just giving a little background on Carrie Washington. It, I mean, what more do I need to say after I say Olivia Pope, right? I start with that. Like, like it's like she's a household name. We all know what Olivia Pope means. But I love in her bio, she calls herself a multi-hyphenate. She has so many talents. She, they probably can't even fit onto one card because she's, of course, star of stage and screen, in front of the screen, behind the screen. She's done so many amazing things. She calls herself a lifelong advocate and activist. And I love that so much. And we're going to dig into that a little bit because I think that's so important. She has her own production company. It's called Simpson Street. I want to ask her why it's called Simpson Street. She has her own jewelry brand. She's an ambassador for OPI, which for the boys out there, you may or may not know it's nail polish, which <laughs> I desperately need. Um, so we're so excited to have you, Carrie. And let's just let me start by offering my sincerest personal thanks to you for taking time to speak to the teens of After School Matters, who I know love you as much as I do and are very, very excited to hear from you. So thank you, Carrie, for being oh. here. Well, thank you for having me. I love having any opportunity to be in conversation with you, as you know. Um, but I'm also really thrilled to meet this amazing community of young people that we've talked about for quite some time. I'm so inspired by this program and so inspired by all of the teens out here watching and all of the incredible adults working with you. So I'm thrilled to be in conversation. I'm so excited to talk to you and to talk to Carvel and Bryn and um, let's get to it. So just so you know, I brag about you all the time after School Matters <laughs> Teens to all of my <laughs> friends. I told them I have these amazing teens in Chicago that are going to be superstars as soon as they enter the world to do all the great things that they will do. And so Carrie knows that. I've talked about you for a long time. So yep. I want to start with just like the most basic question. You are an actor, first and foremost. How did you know that was going to be your calling? Wow, that's such a great question. Um, I, I don't know. It took me a really long time, to be honest, because as you mentioned earlier, I have a lot of interests and I didn't have anyone in my family or my direct circle of influence who worked in the entertainment industry. So it seemed like a far off dream. It seemed like an impossibility to me. Um, I knew that I loved acting. I loved storytelling. I loved performance. I loved stepping into somebody else's shoes and trying to understand why they do what they do and how they do what they do. I love the impact that narrative has on audiences that you get to open people's hearts and minds, but I just didn't see it as a career path. Um, I didn't see myself as a movie star. Um, I didn't see myself as the kind of girl who would be on the cover of magazines because I that wasn't around, you know, there's that idea that if you can see it, you can be it. And I, you know, there was Essence Magazine, but there weren't a lot of, um, I just didn't, I didn't understand the path for myself, um, despite the it, role models that were out there. Through? When did you start to see yourself in that way? 
You know, when I, I, I was at a conservatory program, which is where you really spend all day long studying your art form. And I was doing a summer conservatory program halfway through college in New York City. And I learned that there were unions for actors and that, um, that I could try to be a working actor without ever being a famous actor. And that to me felt like an attainable goal that I could, that I could make a living doing what I love to do without having to be a superstar. It started to take away some of the, um, some of my fear around having to reach a certain kind of pinnacle or define my success according to anybody else's guidelines. And I thought, I just want to try to maybe make a living doing what I love to do. When did you know you were actually good? Oh, I had this experience in high school where I was playing Ophelia in Hamlet and um, the character of Ophelia goes through the a big mad scene. She kind of loses her mind and gets sent to an institution and she, spoiler alert, if you haven't read Hamlet, she winds up killing herself. And, um, and I had this giant mad scene and I was exiting through the audience in my high school auditorium and my mom had been volunteering that night and she was handing out programs at the door like just being a supportive mom um and when I exited the auditorium I noticed that she had been crying watching the mad scene and I think it was the first time that I realized, oh my goodness, this woman who gave birth to me, who knows me inside and out, she knows exactly who I am. For even just half a moment, she believed that I was this other person in this other time having these other experiences. And I thought there's something to this. I don't, I don't think I can walk away from my curiosity and interest and passion about this. Now, your parents were, your father was a stockbroker, your mother was an education consultant, she was a professor. Were they supportive? Like, how did they feel about No. <laughs> no. My dad was actually a real estate broker. Um, and, <laughs> real estate broker, sorry. And they were devastated. I mean, they. my mother used to say to me all the time, like, you know, closing arguments are like monologues. You could just be a lawyer and that would be so much more secure. I think they were devastated about the prospect that their daughter might be a starving artist and might struggle in some way. They just didn't want that for me at all. Um, but I was committed to the hustle. You know, I gave myself a year after college, to be totally honest. I gave myself one year to try to have an impact in this industry, to try to, you know, get some good jobs that could maybe pay even just a portion of my bills. And if nothing had happened in that first year, I was going to go back. I was studying, loosely studying for the LSATs and, and try to go to law or maybe graduate school for education or psych. I hadn't really decided, but I, I, I was like, I'm just going to give this a year and then decide what's next. But in that year, um, luckily, I was able to, to have some really great opportunities. But I really believe that that Seneca quote, that luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. Um, I think I've been really, really, really lucky in my life. I feel very, very blessed for the opportunities that I've had. And you don't really get to control opportunities. I, I've learned in life that you can do a lot to expand the opportunities available to you to place yourself in moments and situations and environments that allow for more expansive opportunity. But opportunity is not something that's completely in our control. Preparation is. Um, and so I'm really grateful that I was able to have kind of the drive and the work ethic and the desire to be prepared for when those moments presented themselves. How hard was it? Or is it? <laughs> because I think people have this idea of television and movie stars and you, you know, being on magazine covers. Yeah. What's the grind like? Oh, I mean, I, I'm from the Bronx originally and I hustle. I mean, I, I joke with Jennifer Lopez all the time that we like, we know how to hustle because well, of where we come from. Like black people. Latin yes. Black. I mean, we're right. Just, it's like, very we true. Have, we have I that hustle. 17 jobs. That's right. And so that's what it was for me. When I graduated from college and I was doing that year, I was working in a restaurant, which is such a cliche for the starving artist, but I was, I was working in a restaurant um, and I was vegan at the time. So it was a vegan restaurant in the village where I could eat so that I didn't have to spend extra money on food. Um, I was teaching yoga. I was certified to teach yoga. I was substitute teaching in New York City public high schools because that was a great job. They would call you that morning if a teacher was sick somewhere in the city or unavailable and there was such a 
teacher shortage at the time. So if I had auditions, I would say, no, I can't come in. But if I didn't, I wound up teaching every grade from kindergarten through senior year of high school all over New York City. Um, I had so many hustles. And and that's on top of the pursuit of a career in acting, which is in itself a full time and a half. Because, you know, one thing I've learned is that part of what is challenging is that you are the product, right? If you choose a life of the arts, you are the CEO of your own organization. And you have to be in charge of your own marketing, your development, your um your scheduling, your, your, you know, you are the talent, but you are also the CFO, you are the CEO, you are the president, you are either the product, you're all of it. And so there is the, the time that it took to just do my craft and study acting and be prepared for the opportunities that presented themselves. And then there was the time that I really had to develop myself as an entrepreneur, as a business person, as a hustler and all these other side gigs. So yeah. It, it, it was hard. And I have to say it continues to be because the reality is that now I continue to have side hustles because my particular relationship with acting is that I like to be able to make choices around my art with as much financial independence and freedom as possible. So that's not to say that I don't make a good living as an artist, but I like to have involvement in other spaces, whether it's the endorsement work, the entrepreneurial space, other places that provide income for me so that when I make choices for myself as an actor, sometimes I can do something just that I love to do, whether it's a big paycheck or not. Um, and so so that's important to me. So I may not be working in a restaurant anymore. I may be a, a creative advisor to a jewelry company or working as a creative ambassador and create and consultant at Neutrogena. The side hustles are different, but they're still there. Also the day like when you're on a television show, just give people an appreciation because you and I've talked about this. I don't think people really understand how hard it is just day in and day out. And you did that for seven years on Scandal. Yeah, I it would always, my, when my friends and family would come to visit set, they wouldn't, they couldn't believe it. I mean, we routinely, regularly worked 16 hour days. Um, and when you're the lead on the show, you very rarely have days off. In the first three seasons of Scandal, I maybe had one day off every other week. Um, and those 16 hours are grueling hours. Now, I I'm not complaining. I would much prefer to do what I love to do um, than a lot of other jobs. I'm not a brain surgeon. What I'm doing is not saving lives. I'm not, you know, when I don't go to work, it may cost a studio some significant dollars, but if the trash collectors don't go to work, like we all get sick and die. So I have a perspective about the importance of what I do. It's not the end all and be all, but, but to do it well and to do it right. And to do it at a high level requires an enormous amount of time and work. I really had to live like an athlete because in order for my body to perform at that level, 16 hours a day, seven years was, it was, um, an extraordinary challenge. And I also learned a lot. So what, what does that mean, live like an athlete? And explain, I mean, you still have to memorize lines. Like, when did you do all this? Like, what does living like an athlete mean? Because I say that to people and I'm running a company. I say I have right. to be conditioned. Yes, Every single that's day right. I have the stamina that I need. So that's what, exactly what, was, right. what did that look like for you? Well, it was when people first ask that, I always think about, you know, you see these award shows, for example, right? The Emmys or the Oscars and everybody's sitting in the audience and, usually they're on Sundays. So for me in, in network television on Monday morning, your day usually starts, I would be in the hair and makeup chair, usually at about 4.45 AM. So when I was in the audience at the Emmys or the Oscars every year, I had several index cards in my purse with monologues lines that I was memorizing between commercial breaks all the time. And there was no such thing as an after party because I knew that I had to get home and be in that hair and makeup chair. Um, the day starts that early. And as I said, 16 hours. So let's say you're starting around five. That means you're going to wrap that evening around nine. And then the next day you come in and do it all again. You may start the next day at nine since you finished, but that means the following day you're going to go until one in the morning. And the week just keeps getting later and later and later as you go along until Friday, we affectionately call Fridays because you may start midday on a Friday, but you'll be shooting until Saturday morning. Um, and so the conditioning for me was, 
figuring out where you squeeze in exercise, making sure that you eat right, making sure that you're creating time to check in on your other areas of business. I also did a couple films and had a couple babies in the midst of those seasons. So the discipline was, um, was tremendous. And and I think that's the thing that that's so important for young people to understand. Number one, that if if you're wanting a life in entertainment to also come and visit a set and see what it's like, because number, there are so many career paths on a film set. You know, you may love being a part of this world and decide that you'd rather work in sound or special effects or in casting or in hair and makeup or with grips and electric, right? There are so many opportunities for being close to this magic that that really is a magical industry, um, but many, many paths. So I always encourage young people that if you're interested in this world to come because we always think about actors because we see them, but there are so many other ways to be a part of the really beautiful community communities of artisans and artists that come together to make these shows and, and films happen. Realistically, how do you make that happen? You're a kid on the west side of Chicago mm -hmm. and you're wondering about um, a career in television or, or a film. How do you get to visit a set? Well, that's such a it's a really great question. I mean, I always think about the hustle for me was like, writing letters. When I was in high school, um, we were reading Malcolm X. We were reading Alex Haley's, you know, seminal book. And Spike Lee was shooting Malcolm X around the corner in Central Park. And I said to my English teacher, can we go? Like, can we go and just try to watch? And, um, and it's so funny because years and years and years later, I worked with Spike as an actor. And I said, do you remember when that girl walked up to you in Central Park? Because I had the audacity to walk up to him in Central Park. And I said, I'd really love to work for you one day. I, I, this is really... <laughs> what I'd like to do. Um, is it okay if I stick around and watch for a little while? We're reading Malcolm X in school. And he was like, yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, to just really be courageous and ambitious and write letters and make phone calls. And I think people are really often, people are very open to young folks who want to observe, who want to learn. And I think that curiosity, you know, thinking early on about being willing to be curious, to not just get the work, but to understand what the work is that you're looking to get into. I think people have a lot of respect for that. And, um, and yeah. And also, you know, reach out to Melody to reach out to me so you can come visit. Okay, great. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, so I have about 5,000 emails I'll have to respond to. Um, and in Chicago, the great thing is there are shows that film in Chicago all the time. Oh, that right. tape, a lot of the Dick Wolf shows tape in Chicago, mm -hmm. like Chicago mm -hmm. Fire and Chicago Police, et cetera. Yeah. And so there is actually an opportunity and they go and shoot in the neighborhoods. That's so right. um, the person who's really who really has the 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 willingness to put themselves out there could That's really right. find it working out for them. So my I first studio film, my first studio film that I did, Save the Last Dance, shot in Chicago. So that was my first time on like a big Hollywood film and my first time living in Chicago. And of course, we know that. that <laughs> we love you. So let me ask you a question about Olivia Pope. Yeah. What did you learn from her? Hmm. I probably should have written a book about all the things that I learned from Olivia Pope um, because she really transformed my life. She was um, such an unapologetic leader and entrepreneur. She really loved that she um, built this company. She loved being the leader of that company, being the founder of that company. And she really understood her value and worth in that marketplace. So those were some of the things she taught me. She taught me to, um, to understand my gifts, to embrace my gifts, to understand the value of those gifts and to not be afraid to walk in the world with them. Um, she also, you know, team meant a lot to her. She carefully cultivated this family as, of misfits and, um, and created a work environment where everyone could thrive with their gifts. And that's something that I also really, I, I saw the parallel between Olivia Pope and Associates and the scandal crew, right? I had an opportunity in the way that Olivia Pope wanted all the people that worked for her to shine and do their best work for the sake of the company. 
I tried to play that role in my cast and crew and to understand that as number one on the call sheet, which is what they call the lead actor, because you're the, the lead of the show, that I had a responsibility to create an environment where people felt like they could run toward excellence and that I could encourage that and support it and affirm it. Um, I did not learn a lot from her about my personal life. Her personal life was a mess. <laughs> I learned to do all of the opposite things that she did in, in her personal life. Um, but I think I also learned um, to never give up. That, that was a big one of her tenants was to never give up. When you are feeling unsure, shaky, you have doubts, what do you do? I pray. I am a spiritual person, so I pray. Um, I journal sometimes because sometimes I find that the, the whirlwind of thoughts about a situation can make it challenging to understand with clarity what the bottom line issue is, like what is the problem that needs to be addressed or solved in this moment. So sometimes journaling helps me slow down my thoughts and get to that. And then for me also, I call my people. You know, like I, I have a, a circle of trusted people, not like a circle of haters and not a circle of yes people, but yeah. friends in my life who will tell me the truth um, and who have like some wisdom or experience in areas that, that are relatable. And I try to call people, you know, and, and that changes right throughout my life. Like when I, when I became a mom, one of those, one of the people that I called a lot, interestingly was my boss, Shonda Rhimes, because she was a, a working mom who I knew was really passionate about being a mother, but also really ambitious about her career. And she became kind of a mommy mentor to me in some ways. Um, but when I was first starting out in my career and I didn't know what from what when it came to fashion on the red carpet, I called my dear friend, Tracy Ellis Ross, who, you know, herself is a fashionista and grew up in the home right. of a, the Vadiva fashionista. <laughs> and so I thought, you know, you reach out to the people who can, who can really help and, um, and who, you know, have your back. Right. So I think that's, that's important for me also is to remember that I'm never alone. Um, and that I'm, I, I, I try to not think of myself as being terminally unique, right? That when I have a challenge, it's a challenge that no one has ever had before, that no one will ever understand. It's like there's somebody out there who's survived this kind of moment, and there's somebody out there who can maybe help me walk through it. That's a good line. You took a month break from social media. Why? I did. I did. I actually took a month um, personal hiatus in general. My social media was part of that but I was really overdue on a personal leave. I think one of the things that can be challenging about being an entrepreneur, a founder, um, a hustler, is that I, I haven't always been good about taking care of myself, putting myself first, or taking downtime, making sure that I'm filling the well. Um, and so actually, you know, I used to blame it on scandal. In the scandal years, I would say, oh, we work these 16-hour days. When the show's over, I'm finally going to have some time to take care of some stuff. And then I noticed that in the couple of years after scandal, I was busier than before. Like I had found ways to create 16 hour days, even when they weren't being dictated to me. Um, and so I thought, okay, I'm the common denominator here. I have to learn how to take better care of myself. Um, and I often think about that Audre Lorde quote, which I'm, I'm not going to get right, but that um, I'm paraphrasing that idea that to take care of myself, self-care um, is not indulgence, it's self-preservation. And particularly for women of color, you know, that self-preservation is, is a political act. It's an act of knowing that I matter in a world that tries to um, make me feel that I don't matter, tries to enact policies in the world that, that try to project the idea that I don't matter. Like I must make myself matter in my world because I matter in this world. And that's, that's a, a political statement as much as it's a personal self-care statement. Well, it's a perfect segue to your activism. So you call mm. yourself an activist, which I think is I really do. powerful. Um, tell me where that comes from and what you're trying to accomplish. Hmm. Um, I guess I just, I've never thought about why I call myself an activist. I just wind up being in 
<laughs> activist mode a lot of the time. Um, you know, early on when I was a teenager, I was in a program um, where I was doing local theater and education, community theater work. And it was sort of at the beginning of the AIDS epidemic. Um, and we did a show that was about safer sex issues and drug abuse and self-esteem. And this work really helped me to understand the cross-section between um, activism and art between social change and art, because we were using art to help save people's lives, to help young people understand that they matter and that they can make better choices and that their lives are worth the consideration of those better choices. Um, and also in that work, obviously, we were doing lots of talking about healthcare, lots of talk about homosexuality. I mean, we were really deeply entrenched in the issues. So um, in that time, I learned that for me to do good in the world, it was as important for me to stand on a stage and embody a character as it was for me to be willing to march at City Hall to say like, no, you cannot tell us that we're not allowed to say the word condom in schools. Um, so that that dialogue between social change and performance has always been a, 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 has always been one that I'm very drawn to. And I think also being an actor, as I said earlier, my, my job is to step into other people's shoes and to understand them. And so there's a level of um, compassion for me that comes with being an actor because I'm often thinking about other people and about um, wanting each of us to know that we are the hero at the center of our own stories. And I think as a Black woman, I've also realized that it, throughout my career, when I have centered myself or the characters that I play, when I've placed myself as a Black woman at the center of a story, that has often been called political, where for me, it's, it's artistic. I'm just telling story. But the idea that I'm making audiences pause in their life and consider a person that is mostly marginalized or consider the life of a, of a person that they normally may want to walk past in the street and ignore, you know, acting has, be, has become political, whether I like it or not. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm an activist because I believe that everybody has a right to be the center of their own story and a hero in their journey. And um and we have to make that sure that that's true, not just in the stories we tell, but in the world that we live in. When you think about, you use the word political, um, you were obviously very active politically with the most recent campaign. You were traveling all over during the pandemic, which is saying a lot in many ways, endangering yourself and potentially mm -hmm. your family to, ever, to affect change. But the question I wonder about now is if sort of you feel like you, you accomplished a big goal there and then now, uh, voting in many ways is under siege um, and rights are being uh, really uh, challenged mm -hmm. to use more, you know, attacked. To be, mm -hmm. Right. So where are you on that? How, how, what does an activist, an activist acts? Mm -hmm. So what do you do? Which I think is interesting. You're both an actor and an activist and act is, is the core to both of those concepts. What are you doing yeah, now? So Right now, one of the things that I'm most passionate about is the For the People Act, which is in the hands of the Senate right now. Um, I want to give some context for that for all of our teens. Um, and first say, I have, I've always been really passionate about voting, which might be really weird. I'm not afraid to say I'm a little bit of a political nerd, which is part of maybe why Olivia Pope came into my life. But I love voting because voting is where we get to have our voice heard in our society. Like if you care about the clothes you wear, if you care about the food you eat, if you care about where you live or what your schools are like, or how many beds are in your hospital, um, all of that is impacted by voting. And voting is not this sort of politics, is not this idea that happens on a big hill in Washington, D.C. in these white buildings with men in suits. Politics is the everyday reality of how we live our lives, the rules that govern how we live our life. We're so lucky to live in a democracy where we get to have a voice about those rules and say what we want those rules to be. But it only works if we show up and vote. It only works if we all participate. So I really feel like helping people to understand the power that we truly have in our own communities to make change, to be that lead in the story of our own communities and lives, 
that's what encouraging voting is for me. And I am really, really passionate about it. Um, in last year in 2020, I signed on to Michelle Obama's When We All Vote initiative to really encourage voting. And this year, I'm a co-chair of, of that organization. And this year, our focus really is on protecting voting rights, because there is this attack on voting rights. But I, I just want to say in particular to the young people that the reason why these attacks are happening is because of the amazing number of young people that came forward in the last election. It's working. Democracy is working. More young people are voting than ever before. More women are voting than ever before. More people of color are voting than ever before. And what that means is that the people who have power, some of the people who have power and don't want those voices heard are now trying to fracture the voting system so that you don't get to have your voice as easily or that I don't get to have my voice as easily. And we have to protect our voices. Um, so the For the People Act is in the hands of the Senate right now. There's so much you can do. I'll put some stuff on social media and I can send assets if you'd like to just let your senators know, even if you can't vote, you can always let your senators know that you live in this community, that you believe that this is important. Their job is to represent us. All these public servants, whether it's police officers, Congress people, they, we literally pay their bills, but we somehow forget that sometimes and we think that they're the ones who are in charge. We have to remind them that they work for us and we have to let them know what their tasks are for the day. It really is your first taste of being a boss. Like if you want to be a boss in your world, if you want to be a boss in your life, you start by bossing up with our elected officials and letting them know that they work for you because they do. When you work and you pay your taxes, when those taxes are taken out of your paycheck, whether you like it or not, that's because you're paying their salaries. You are the boss. That's awesome. I love that. I never thought of it in that way before. And I'm a believer like you are in voting and the importance of making sure we hold our leaders accountable for their mm -hmm. words and deeds and yeah. make sure that everyone has a fair shot in our society, which we know is not mm -hmm. yet true. So I'm going to ask my last question before I turn it over to our phenomenal teens, Brett and Chevelle. But first, <laughs> I'm going to just ask my last question. Okay, so we've all lived through this pandemic. Our teens are not even in school. They're still Zooming in. And we want to have these programs to keep them feeling connected to a community that I think is really powerful and important. And I just wonder during this pandemic what you've learned you know, not, you know, it's for every person, it's had a different effect. Is there a big takeaway for you? When I think about the big picture of the pandemic, I feel like one of the things we've all learned and something that has been heavy on my heart is how much our inequities have been exposed. You know, the, the over-indexing impact on working women, um, the just the crazy amount of death in the Black community, in the Latinx community. Um, I, I have been so moved and um, really inspired to figure out how to be, how to make sure that as we return to normal, that we don't return to normal, that we return to addressing these systems and figuring out how we do better. Um, because these inequities have been just so revealed. Um, they've always been there, but the pandemic has really made us have to see in such blatant ways how vastly different this virus has impacted our communities. Um, and then on a personal level, I feel really grateful to be forced to stay at home for a little bit. Um, to have, you know, my parents who are New Yorkers, they were visiting me in Los Angeles. And so when the pandemic happened, they got stuck here because I wasn't going to let my older parents um, on a plane in the middle of the pandemic. So they've been with me for a year. Um, and that time spent to have my parents and my kids all in one place together, it's been very, very special. Um, and I've been forcing myself to ask my parents more questions and sometimes record the conversations because I just think these are these are really unique times. So I'm grateful for that time. That's great. Well, listen, I want to give our teens a shot. I could talk to you forever. You know that forever. I love and admire you so much. Let's oh, it's so mutual to Bryn and Chevelle and they're going to take it from here and I'll come back 
uh, after they get a, a bit of time to talk to you. Okay. Hi, Bryn. <laughs> Hi, Carvel. Hi. Hi, Carrie. Um, I just want to say it's so amazing to get to speak with you today, to be able to meet you, um, to have a conversation. Um, I just first want to start off with saying, you know, it is so clear from your work that you just pour yourself into each and every role that you play. So what is like your all time favorite role and how has it impacted you? Oh, um, <laughs> It's such a hard question because I love all of my characters as if each of them was a child. <laughs> like it's so I don't want to pick a favorite. And I think, you know, what's interesting for me, I've learned throughout my career is that these characters, these projects often come into my life to teach me something. I think every every character is like an opportunity for me to grow. Um, and so it's hard to say which one I love the most because they've each had such a profound impact on me. And I really mean that. I mean, whether it's playing Olivia Pope or whether it's playing some character in some independent film that nobody's ever seen, like it still means so much to me. What she taught me has had a huge impact on me. So I'm not going to choose favorites. I, I just, I refuse to. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, but, fancy. but I will say I loved living in Chicago. I loved playing Chanel and Save the Last Dance. And that was my first big studio film. So it had a really huge impact on me because um, it was my first time being a part of like the entertainment industry. Mm -hmm. Love that movie. <laughs> Um, so earlier you spoke to your experience during the pandemic, um, and I would love to know how have you stayed encouraged during this time, during this entire, you know, pandemic? I, as I mentioned before, I am a praying person. Um, so part of staying encouraged has been that. I, I think you both sing in, in gospel choir. Did I get that right? Is that true? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was thinking, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I love so I thought yes. I'm talking to some other believers. Um, <laughs> I'm so praying is a big part of it for me. But I think like, as I was saying to Melody, you know, I have to stay encouraged by staying connected to people, you know, people who I love and, and relationships where um, there's a mutual respect and admiration, people that I that I want to travel through life with. I think it's been these have been isolating times in some ways because we don't get to be in a classroom. We don't get to be on set um, or we haven't been for the most part. And so it's really important to, to, for me, it's been really important to find other ways to connect with loved, loved ones, whether it's on Zoom or socially distanced dates outside or, you know, whatever it is, finding ways to, um, to not feel so alone. Yeah. And just like you've been staying connected, um, learning how to stay connected through technology and with Zoom, so many people have picked up new musical interests, have been discovering new hobbies that they didn't even know that they liked. Um, so a lot of people are incorporating art into their self-care mm -hmm. routines that they use every day. So mm -hmm. do you think that this pandemic has elevated the need for more artists? Wow. That's such a fantastic thought. You know, I, I want to add to my last answer that I've also, I think I've also been really encouraged by knowing that young people, that you guys are witnessing the resilience in my children and in other people's kids and in folks like you. It's been really inspiring because that resilience is... Um, it's, it's a tremendous example of what's possible in the human spirit. And I think young people do that better than anybody else. Um, so thank you for that. And then, yeah, I think, you know, I think the arts have become really important in the pandemic. I think the arts are always important, but I do think in times like this, we go to art for inspiration and for hope. Um, we go to art to fill our time. I think in many ways, you know, sometimes I think about my job as, as providing kind of modern day meditation because, you know, in the old days, communities would come together. I mean, like in, in prehistoric times, right? People would come together by a fire around a fire and tell stories the, or the old griot and different indigenous cultures would tell stories by the fire. And we are that now in television and film, you know, it's no longer the light of the fire. It's the flicker on the screen, but people are coming together to gather and witness stories. And in those stories, 
we realize who we want to be. We realize who we don't want to be. Um, we see the possibilities. We visit our own nightmares. So I think the arts are really important in helping us to understand to understand ourselves, to understand this moment, um, both the arts and humanities. I've been reading a lot lately about the 1920s, about the Roaring Twenties, because I'm thinking a lot about you know what happened at the end of the Spanish flu in 1918. And then in the twenties, there was this explosion of arts, right? In the Harlem Renaissance and with the flappers and, and thinking like, what will that look like for us now, a hundred years later? I think we may have a similar kind of Renaissance explosion. It's an interesting thought. Yeah. Um, I totally agree with you. I, I've been <laughs> totally invested in history. It's, it's amazing. Um, mm -hmm. um, but early you spoke to your role in activism and I would love to know how your activism has impacted your career. Mm. You know, it's funny, early on in my career, I was going to some, I think I was marching in New York. The, the, the Republican convention was in New York and there were particular issues. I think it was a war. I went to an anti-war march mm. and, um, and I marched for really, I remember <laughs> I had come from a photo shoot, so I was in high heels and I marched for really far in these high heels. That's why it really sticks in my mind. And my dad at the time said, um, you know, you, you might want to think about being aware of um, maybe not being as vocal about your beliefs because you might offend some people or there might be people who don't want to work with you because of particular beliefs. And, um, and I remember in that moment really thinking long and hard about it and I decided that I was never going to let my job rob me of my responsibilities in a representational democracy, that I had a responsibility in order for democracy to work, to have my voice heard. And I never want to silence myself in the name of fame or in the name of um, a paycheck, right? That, that my commitment to the belief in humanity and to justice is more important to me than my own comfort. Um, that's not to say I don't like to be comfortable, because I do. But, <laughs> but to understand that, that, that for me, that comfort cannot be at the expense of my, um, of my ethical framework and my belief in humanity. Amen. <laughs> I agree with that. Um, I think that many, of course, youth could you know, understand that before they go and take on their careers. And I remember earlier you were saying that um, as a youth, you know, when you're into art that you should go to a set or, you know, try to figure out where they're filming, you know, just to see if it fits in where you want to. Um, and is there like one tip that you would give to aspiring actors like myself um, who want to go into film? Well, this, you know, so this is interesting because people always think like now it's so easy to say no now. Like if you read a script now and you say like, oh, that's just not going to be good for black people or that script is not good for women. Right. Like it's easy for you to say no now. But the reality is at the very beginning of my career, I said to my agents and manager, I would prefer to work six extra, extra shifts at this restaurant than take on a role that I think is going to be bad for black people or bad for women. Mm -hmm. And if you don't do it in the beginning, it doesn't get easier to do it later. You have to know early on what your lines are. And those lines may change, right? Like those, those, lines you draw in the sand, they will evolve with time. There are times in my career I've been willing to do certain things and other times I've been unwilling, but, but you, but, but I think knowing what's right for you is really important. Um, and in general, for me, that kind of self-awareness is really important. Even asking oneself, why do I want a career in entertainment, right? Mm -hmm. Because I think some people come to entertainment to fill a void in themselves, to provide a mm -hmm. sense of self. Like if I can get everybody in the world to like me, then maybe I'll like myself. And the reality is it doesn't matter how many people outside of you like you, if you don't like yourself, you're not going to like yourself. And <laughs> getting said <laughs> no, <laughs> having people say no to you, a hundred auditions in a row, having people say, get, receiving that rejection again and again and again, you will not survive it if you don't figure out how to love yourself outside of the responses of the public. Because listen, tomorrow I could make a movie that tanks at the box office and that every critic hates, hates. 
right? Like there's never a guaranteed place, especially as, a, as an artist who wants to take risks and, and be creative and have an adventure. You don't get to always be liked by everybody. It's just not a reality. So for me, it's important to ask yourself, why are you coming to this business? Are you coming to contribute and to offer something of yourself? Or are you coming to fill your own needs and to be accepted and loved? You want to figure that out before you jump in the game. It'll you'll last a lot longer if you do. Wow! Wow! <laughs> okay, you out here preaching. Um, uh, I, yeah, you. Yeah. <laughs> um, but staying on the topic of your career and um, in connected to your activism, have you ever encountered colorism in or racism in film? in the film and television industry as a black woman? And if so, how did you receive support um, to face and overcome those barriers? Oh, of course I have. Yeah. Of course I have. Mm -hmm. I remember one film, I won't say what it was, but I was on a film where I had a different understanding of what the script was going to be. And I knew that the choices that had been made had been made because I was a black woman. And so there was a limitation placed on what my character was going to be able to do in the project. And I sat in my trailer crying and begging the producers to fire me. I was like, I just, I don't want to do this. Like, please. I gave them a list of other actresses to call. <laughs> I was like, just desperate to not be a part of this project. And I called a friend of mine, I actually called Chris Rock at the time. And Chris said, you cannot be surprised by these moments. I had just worked with Chris on um, on a film that nobody has ever seen, starring Chris Rock and Anthony Hopkins. So I was super excited to be a part of this movie that was a huge box office tank. Um, I think it was called Bad Company. It was supposed to be a huge hit. But I, I called him and I said, like, I don't know what to do. I want them to fire me. And Chris said, I don't remember how he said it, but he said it in that very, you know, hilarious way. He was like, you cannot let them surprise you. When they do this, you cannot be surprised. You're going to encounter racism again and again and again in your career. And if you let it get you, if you let it catch you off guard like this, it will be your fault. Mm. Um, I was like, okay, okay. I have to expect it. Um, there have been, yeah, lots of moments, you know, early on in my career, being told that I wasn't pretty enough or sexy enough um, mm -hmm. because I wasn't more of a Halle Berry type. You know, she was the generation right before me. So how that how that got metabolized by me was biracial is better, right? And then later, and so that, that was like, how do I fight that off and just know that like who I am is enough um, and brilliant and beautiful. Later on in my career, um, being told that I was too much of a Halle Berry type, that if I wanted to be taken seriously, I had to be willing to to like get ugly and do things that were more fierce and, and being compared to other actresses like Uzo and Viola, right, who were more gritty actresses. Mm -hmm. It's like people will constantly put you in a box or decide what your limitations are. And so you just, that's the other reason, you know, to go back to um, your earlier question about, about advice, you know, again, know who you are, know who you are, because uh, there are, like I said, there are all these magnificent careers that are part of the entertainment industry in, in the technical aspects and the creative aspects. There's also an entire industry of people who make their business off of your fame. And those people, agents, managers, publicists, they will get you they will. I don't want to say they will. The possibility exists that you can lose yourself in chasing an idea of who you're supposed to be in order to have a career. But you're going to have the career that's yours and you're going to have it by being you. So understanding, again, who you are, what your gifts are, what your unique boundaries are, what you want to do, what you don't want to do. That's all the special sauce that makes you uniquely who you are as an artist. And that's what you have to walk in the room with. That's the gift you have to offer. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Um I just, thank you for sharing that, um, to be able to hear Wait, that. By the way, for those of you who are not interested in the arts, I'm so sorry to cut you off, <laughs> okay. but those of you who are not interested in the arts, that's just as true 
whether you're in a business environment or an entertainment environment, right? Now I'm at a place in the growth of my production company where I now have an executive coach. I'm having to learn how to grow my leadership skills in an administrative managerial level to the same extent that I feel really comfortable with those skills in a creative setting. So Mm -hmm. those dynamics are all true. Whether you're on a set or you're in a boardroom, you have to know what your gifts are. You have to know what your responsibilities are. You have to know what you can bring to the table and then bring it unapologetically, but not try to be somebody you aren't. And I don't mean that doesn't mean you grow. You Your responsibility is to grow and evolve and to continue to hyphenate yourself as I, as I try to do. But you don't, you're not going to be successful being somebody else in your life because your life is yours. Right. Um, just thank you for that. I feel like everybody should be able to hear that. Um, but specifically, I'm very much inspired for you are such a successful black woman um, and to be able to be at a place where I hope to be one day, I'm very much inspired. And even though you have had to overstep those barriers, you've still been successful on screen and behind the camera. And so I just wanna know what that transition was like for you to go from being in front of the camera to being behind it and how has directing evolved your career? Um. So I'm so excited for you, Bryn. Um, So I think that, and you Carvel, I didn't mean to leave you out. So um, I think, you know, for me, I said earlier, I love that Seneca quote that, um, you know, luck is when preparation meets opportunity. For me, moving behind the camera was a conscious decision to help create more opportunity for myself. Mm -hmm. It was a way to give, and and also in the way that I talk about my passion around democracy, right? The, The knowing that my voice matters, that my seat at the table in this world matters. The same is true when it comes to the entertainment industry. So the first film I ever produced was a film called Confirmation. It was the story of um, the confirmation hearings for Clarence Thomas and when Anita Hill came forward. It was a film we made for HBO. And when I told that story as a black woman, I knew that I wanted to have a seat at the table at how that story was told. I knew I didn't just want to be a hired help Right. I didn't just want to be hired as an actor to come in and say what other people want me to say, how they want me to say it, and then be sent home. I wanted to be able to be one of the driving forces behind how that story was told to make sure that it was told in a way that made me comfortable and felt authentic to my experience as a Black woman. So producing and directing is part of how I'm creating more opportunities. And this is what's been really exciting, not just more opportunities for myself. In wanting to have the opportunity to have more of a voice, what I've realized is that stepping into that new role has allowed me has allowed me to create new sets, you know, where mm-hmm. we have shows like Little Fires Everywhere or the play I made American Sun, and then we made the film. Those sets provide employment for hundreds of people. Again, in all those careers from editing to costume design to set design to box office to publicity and marketing, those careers are based on me now putting that content out into the landscape and saying, I need a team of artists and artisans, of people who want to run toward excellence with me to bring this into the world. So I'm so passionate now about utilizing this desire to tell story, to upend the idea of who belongs at the center of a story, to use that passion to create opportunities for other people to step into the lead role in their lives as artists. Wow. <laughs> Every time she talks, it's just, it's just so amazing. <laughs> um, but staying on the topic of directing, as a director, what do you think um, is the most co- culturally responsible way to showcase Black stories in film and in TV? The most culturally responsible way to tell Black stories? Yeah. Well, I think that what's really important is that we tell a lot of Black stories because Mm -hmm. where things get really challenging is when there's only one or two stories about us because then we feel like that one story has to be everything. And there's a lot of different kinds of Black people in the world. We live a lot of different paths in a lot of different ways. And the more that we have stories about us in the world, the more that that beautiful spectrum of who we are gets to be on display. I think 
more important than having like one kind of responsible way to tell a story. It's about giving communities opportunity to tell lots of stories about themselves so that our humanity can be full, can be three-dimensional, can be flawed at sometimes, um, aspirational at others, right? Because that's the reality of who people are. If you have one film, for example, in the last five years that is starring an Asian cast and about an Asian family, then that's it. Right. That's what that's the story about that community. And that's not okay. So it's wonderful that you're having more and more films about Asian folks, more and more films about black folks, more and more films about Latinx communities, about the Muslim community, about all different kinds of people, because we are not one thing. Not any of us is one thing. And, you know, when you go home and you look at your own family, there's a million ways to be black. So being able to have more than one show, more than one movie, to be able to have a community of storytellers who are bringing these stories forward. I think that's what's most important. And that our that our studios and networks continue to support that multiplicity of stories. Wow. And I agree with you so much um, because of how influential art is on our society. Like people emulate what they see on television mm -hmm. or what they see in film. And so in what ways have you observed theater or have observed film affecting social discourse? Oh, wow. Well, I have a bunch of heroes. You know, I talked about like, even though I, I didn't have people in my family who did this for a living. So it was hard for me to understand, like, where do I go? What do I do? But I had these women who were like lighthouses across the ocean who were doing this work, really beautiful work, and also were standing up for social justice. Women like Cicely Tyson, who we just lost, who was a dear, dear friend of mine. Same with Diane Carroll, who was like a dear friend and mentor. Um, Rita Moreno is another one. She's from the Bronx and a woman of color. Um, I felt that that same sort of affinity, believe it or not, with Barbara Streisand because she was a Jewish woman at a time in, high, in Hollywood where her kind of beauty was not perceived as normal. And she carved out her own path to say, no, I will not change my nose. I'm going to be who I am and I'm going to have the career that I deserve. Um, or, or Jane Fonda, who's somebody who, you know, we don't come from similar places. She comes from a legacy family of artists, but she has never been afraid to bring her politics forward in her work. Actually, the union, I don't know if you guys know this, but there was a very famous movie um, in the, I think it's late 70s, early 80s called Nine to Five. That was one of the first workplace comedies about working women in the office. The union for administrative assistance is called Nine to Five because that union was formed in response to that film exposing how hard it was for women working in offices. Um, so these women were real role models for me and, and people who I still look to because they continue to work, continue to innovate. They've worked across multiple platforms, stage, film, television. They sing, they dance, they act, they direct, they produce. So, you know, these are those are some of my role models. Yes. Um, I, I believe this will be our last question. Um, um, so a, a lot of times um, in life that we all go through different struggles, but uh, specifically during this pandemic, a lot of teens have gone, have struggled with mental health, especially with e-learning. Um, so what were some challenges that you faced as a teenager um, and how are they different or, and or similar to the teens, um, what teens face today? Mm. Well, first of all, because I know this is your last question, I just want to say you two have done a phenomenal job. It's been so fun to speak to you both. Really, really wonderful. So thank you for being so generous and thoughtful and intentional with your questions. Um, you know, I can't imagine. I, I have three kids. One of my kids is a teenager. Um, and I can't imagine the challenge that you guys are facing right now with e-learning and being away from your friends. Um, my heart really goes out to you with a great deal of compassion. And um, and again, I'm really inspired and impressed by how resilient you've been and, and how flexible you've been and, and able to continue to show up. It's been really powerful to witness. Um, when I was a teenager, I, I think I was not dealing with a global pandemic. I was dealing with an epidemic. We were dealing with the HIV crisis. Um, which you know had a big impact on how we thought about our bodies and our relationships. Um, but I was mostly, I think, when I was a teenager, struggling with this thing we wound up talking a lot about, which is like 
who am I and what are my gifts and what do I have to bring to the table? I feel caught between lots of different worlds. I feel like I belong to the Bronx, but I also belong to this fancy prep school that I go to, that I spend an hour on a subway going to every day. And how do I reconcile those different communities? And I want to be somebody who's really smart. I want to continue to study history and sociology and psychology, but I also really love the arts. And how do I reconcile that? And, you know, I think one day I want to get married and have kids, but I also want to be a badass feminist and and fight for what's right for women. And so like, I felt really caught between these worlds, um, these dualities of who I was and what I wanted. You know, I, I, I wanted to be able to run with lots of ambition towards success, but I also didn't want to be defined by material things. So I think that's really natural to be a teenager and just be asking like, where do I fit in to all of these extremes in this world? Um, and I, I, I find that a lot of that has just been sorted out through time, right? Of like figuring out, not thinking about these things as, as either or, but figuring out where, where I fall on the spectrum of all of those ideas and being willing to carve my own path. That's not one thing or the other, but that has just a little bit of everything that's uniquely me and, and knowing that that's okay. That it's okay to be me, to want what I want, to be who I am. Um, whether other people get it or not, or whether other people like it or not, as long as I can figure out how to do that and make a living and, and be around people who, you know, go where the love is, be with people who respect me and are good to me and be good to myself. Um, then I'll, I'll, I'll be okay. I think that's what I'm still telling myself one day at a time these days. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. We really appreciate you yes. so much. It, this is an amazing opportunity for me and uh, uh, yeah. both of us. It's I, been so great to be able to just talk to you yes. and get your advice. And, you know, I love to be able to learn from people who are in the industry and who are having the career so that way I can know what to do when I get there. So yes. thank you again. Thank you so much. Thank you guys. Stay curious. I love your curiosity. That idea of being a lifelong learner will serve you as artists more than anything else. That, that commitment to discovery and curiosity. And I find that that's true in every area as it is in the arts, right? In business and raising a family. Curiosity is the thing that will save you if you stay open, I think. Yeah. yeah. I'm curious, <laughs> but I think. <laughs> well, I want to thank Carvel and, and Bryn you are, and both of you were so phenomenal. I was hanging right? up the word. You guys, you know, make After School Matters so proud. And you are a true reflection of the talent and the excellence that we have. Carrie, you said so many things that really stuck with me. I had to actually write them down. And I just want to read back a couple that I thought were just so profound for our team. This idea that opportunity is not completely in our control, but preparation is. I think that is really, really something to hang on to for all of us. You are the product. That's not just about being an actor. That's whatever you do in life, whatever you're trying, wherever you're trying to succeed, you are your own product. And whether you're walking into an office or into an operating room or onto a set, I think that's true. I think the idea that at Scandal, you were trying to create an environment where people could run towards excellence was something that we can all aspire to as we create environments and our teens one day are bosses or working in mm -hmm. companies. And I think this idea of trying not to think of yourself as terminally unique, I've never mm. thought of that concept in that way before. That is a big one because I think people are constantly saying, why me? Or why do I have these struggles, et cetera? And I think- I think especially as, as, as women of color, as people of color, we're always the first. We're often the first and the only. So reminding ourselves that we're not terminally unique and that there, if we reach out, there are people that can be part of our sisterhood is really important. I think that's really great. And then the last two, um, there are a million ways to be black. Isn't that the mm -hmm. truth? So yeah. great. Amen. And being comfortable Amen. in whatever your version of it is, or Latinx, or whatever mm -hmm. it might be, gender, fluidity, yeah. et cetera. And then last but not least, know who you are. It may take a while to get there, but you certainly are proof positive of what the journey can be and how powerful it can be in influencing other people. So with my sincerest thanks, really, I know the, the, the polls on your time. I know what it's like. I just want to thank you so much for spending time with our teens. 
It's been such a pleasure. Really, they are such a testament to the excellence of this program. And I love you so much. Thank you for lending your time to these teens and to this program. It's making the world a better place. Yes, it is. They are going to go make the world a better place. And then we can mm-hmm. we can self-care. <laughs> yes, exactly. We need you guys to make the world a better place so we can self-care. <laughs> <laughs> Take care. Lots of love. Bye, Thanks. everybody. Carvel and Bryn. Bye. 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 B